All right, welcome to another special episode of Nathan Builds Robots. Today we're here with Mark from Speed 3D. Mark, it's nice to meet you. Yeah, you too, Nathan. This is our light speed system. This is a cold spray additive manufacturing system. What cold spray is, is we're taking a converging diverging rocket nozzle and high pressure compressed air and we're able to accelerate the air through that nozzle to about Mach 3 in terms of speed. And then we introduce metal powder particles to that um, airstream, and that accelerates the particles to Mach 3 where they impact a substrate plate or a part and build a part up in 3D. You said you're using a rocket nozzle. Is that like literally like what they use on a spaceship? We're not actually combusting in our nozzle. We're just sending air through it. But uh, you know, from a rocket science standpoint, it's the same sort of calculations going that um, are determining the, the speed of the air moving through it. And how are you generating that pressure that's used to propel the particles? Um, so you can't see it, but behind this cabinet, there's a high pressure compressed air system. It's a uh, reciprocating piston, basically compressor, three stages that gets us up to about 35 bar, which is roughly 550 PSI. The other question I had about this process is you're starting from just a, a plain piece of metal and you're impacting powder onto it but how do you make sure that that powder sticks to the part? Because I could imagine, you know, if you throw some sand at a wall, it's just gonna bounce off. And there's something called the yield strength of the material, which has to do with how hard it is or how much energy it takes to deform or reshape that material. And so we're basically tailoring our process and our powder size so that the kinetic energy contained in the powder as it's traveling at close to Mach 3 is enough to deform it and cause it to stick to whatever it hits to. Do you run into any problems if the powder is accelerated too fast? It can have an impact in terms of uh, basically the, the shape of the parts and residual stresses inside of the part. There's a lot of process optimization that goes into defining the powder specifications. We can adjust temperatures and pressures and things like that to optimize. Wow, that uh, sounds like a really interesting process. Cold spray is not a new process. Uh, interestingly, it's been around and commercialized for well over 30 years. What we've done that is new and interesting is combine that with a robotic end of arm tool that allows us to do tool paths and build parts up in 3D versus just do simple repair jobs applied by hand. Yeah, and I took a look at this machine earlier and it looks like instead of moving the nozzle, which is how a lot of FDM 3D printers work, this one's moving the whole part and build tray. That's exactly right. So there's a lot of uh, plumbing and considerations in the actual nozzle itself. So it'd be very difficult to move that around. We have a manifold, a rocket nozzle, heaters. Um, so moving all those and keeping a seal when you're dealing with 550 PSI or 35 bar pressure would be difficult. So we keep that stationary. It's much easier to move the part above that. So here's an example part that we've been building here at the show. The rocket nozzle spraying upward and our robot is sort of controlling the motion like that to, uh, to build the geometry that we see here. Wow, okay, yeah, let's take a look at this. So, oh, that's heavy. So what's, uh, what's going on with all the different colors here? Um, so that's some surface oxidization. Typically we see that as the build is progressing, there's some high temperature air and some uh, friction from the you know, deflected powder particles going across the surface. But if you cut through the inside of that, you would see it's just as bright and shiny as a penny. Here we have some materials it looks like. Currently, these are the four validated materials, which are copper, aluminum, aluminum bronze, and it's not shown here, but we also have a stainless steel as well. So there you can see the as sprayed texture. And then you know once you cut through that, it's a fully dense solid. You can't see any pores or anything like that. Yeah, this looks just like a solid bar of aluminum that you've just machined flat. I'll jump over to this copper right here. You'll notice that it's very heavy. Copper is about four times more dense than the uh, aluminum. And then here we have, it's called uh, aluminum bronze, which is actually an alloy a blend between the copper and aluminum powder. Could you mix the aluminum and copper powder together? and then it turns into bronze when it gets deposited? That's exactly what's happening. That's, um, that's crazy. what we call like a compositional alloy, where we're basically you know, combining different you know, dissimilar metals in terms of the powder, and when they spray, they mix and fuse together and uh, produce a, a completely new alloy. Now that you've got educated on the process, let's build something, Nathan. So um, right here I'm gonna load, this is just the substrate holder and substrate plate. Um, this will snap into the, uh, the end of the robot right here. And once that's secured and locked in, we can go ahead and close the build chamber. Right here we can see the actual um, real-time head temperature of the air passing through the nozzle and the pressure and the amount of powder that's in the system right now. What we're doing right now is ramping up from ambient temperature to about 500 degrees C. Our head pressure is coming up and will max out at around 30 bar. So once these two set points are reached, this machine will be ready to print. 
So this has a negative pressure reading on there. What is that about? There's a dust collection system that's extracting the deflected powder particles that don't stick on the part. And so this is monitoring the pressure inside the build chamber that's created by that dust extraction vacuum system. All right, so Mark's taking care of another customer right now, but uh, I think this thing's ready to start printing, so I'm just gonna go ahead and push the button here. Oh, there it goes. I assume you gotta do some kind of heat management. Do you ever have like cooling air or, or like uh, liquid cooling on the backside, or you just not worry about that? Um, not really, I mean, it's relatively low temperature. The air out of the nozzle is only about up to about 500 degrees C, so it doesn't get super hot. The build chamber will never go over about 40 degrees C. And uh, do you intentionally heat the build chamber to control the process? Or? It's not about the part, it's just residual heat from the flow stream. So the flow stream of that compressed air is heated for two reasons. Number one, the higher temperature air actually travels at a faster velocity through the nozzle. And then the other aspect is that softens the material a little bit to reduce the yield strength so it does stick well when it impacts. Talking about this technology and its relationship to kind of like rocket propulsion, um, are there applications for this in space? Like I could imagine, you know, if you put one of these up in space, would you be able to print parts out there just fine or? Nobody's done that yet. And uh, that's not something that we're really, you know, trying to print in space. I think getting this into orbit would, uh, would be quite expensive. Outside of space, one of the advantages of this process is the fact that it's very deployable. So we have a lot of projects and things going on with uh, defense companies and um, defense organizations looking to use these to produce parts to support battlefield operations. We have a version of this machine that's self-contained with the air compressor, dust collector, and machine. It can be unloaded from a truck, plugged in, and be operational in as little as 30 minutes. Would you say that defense is kind of your primary customer, or do you have people in manufacturing? Defense is certainly uh, you know, our biggest customer and our biggest area of interest. We have a lot going on right now with universities that are interested in R&D work and development of applications. So we have some commercial engagements, but this process is so new that really industry hasn't quite discovered what its limitations are and really worked through all of the potential applications that this could provide some value in terms of being faster parts, better parts, cheaper parts than they're producing today. What kind of material properties do you get out of this? So the general uh, spectrum I would create is to basically say you have castings on the low end and forgings on the high end. We're typically between those two, a little closer to the forging end. Oh, so okay. generally better than a casting, but not as good as a forging. And uh, is there any kind of post-processing that you'll do to, to change those properties? Once the build's done, you can heat treat, you can hip or hot isostatic press. After that, you can do post-machining to do critical fine features, flat faces, add in sealing surfaces, whatever you want to do after the fact. It's a real metal part. And what's the importance of the heat treating process? Like why would you want to go through that after printing a part versus just using it straight out of the machine? So there can be some residual stresses in the part as it leaves the printer, but the big reason is it allows formation of a strong crystal structure that improves the material properties. So generally speaking with a heat treated part, we'll see better ductility and better yield strength overall as compared to a raw part right out of the system. Our larger systems have a working area of about 700 millimeters in diameter and about 1,000 millimeters tall. Wow. So that's almost a little over two feet in diameter by three foot tall in terms of the working envelope. We've talked about the aluminum, the copper, and the aluminum copper, which is like your bronze material. Are there any other materials that are commonly used on your machines? You can do some carbide materials, some Inconel materials. We've demonstrated that these are all completely possible. We haven't fully commercialized them just yet because they still need some more process optimization. All right, so welcome back, everyone. The print just finished up, so we're gonna take it out and take a look at it. First, you did a great job building that part, so we'll acknowledge the job is done, unlock the door, go ahead and open the uh, release latches, and here it's just two spring-loaded, uh, you know, securing mechanism, locking that on there. So it's still quite warm, actually, so if you hold it, hold it from this Teflon part. Okay. Um, I'm surprised you trusted me with this. This is uh, pretty toasty. All right, well, cool. Now we have our first printed part, my first metal 3D printed part, so uh, this is a big day for me. So let's take a, a closer look at this. The parts we're looking at here represent some of the projects we've done with our defense users. So these are all things that are on some sort of uh, military ground vehicles. Here we see a, a large sprocket, a clevis mount, and a tow hook. Think of in a battlefield type of operation, it's 
get the tank out of the ditch, right? These parts are crude. They're probably not as good as the original broken parts that they're replacing. But if it's just enough to get back in the fight, that can make all the difference for the war fighters that we're supporting with our equipment. How much material do you save uh, by making a near net shape using your process versus like machining this out of a single block of material? Well, that would be very geometry dependent, but applications like this, it's not really about the, you know, the savings or the cost really, but Think of the logistics of carrying enough billets in every size and shape part that you would need into the field for repair. It's not practical. Where we can load up one truck with you know, all the powders that we need that could become any shape that, uh, that's needed. So here we're showcasing parts that would support, we'll call it natural resources and oil and gas. Anytime uh, you know, you're mining, it could be a very remote location. Spare parts and all that could be difficult to obtain or, or get going. These are mining operations where if they go down, it could potentially be costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour in lost revenue because the whole operation's not working because one component has failed. A machine like this would allow you to replace that faulty, broken component as needed in real time. For the post-processing machining, do you supply the solutions for that or do you rely on them to have their own machine equipment? You know, we really uh, don't get into that space. There's literally hundreds of you know, potential products out there that support uh, end part machining, milling, lathes, whatever's needed. So usually a customer will just uh, explore one of the many commercially available solutions for that portion of the process. One of the big uh, selling points of your product, as far as I understand, is how fast it is. I mean, speed 3D, that makes you think of a speedy process. How big of an advantage in terms of speed do you have with your machines? So this is kind of the biggest part on the table. This one is about six pounds of aluminum, close to three kilograms. And this part builds in just over two hours. Wow, only two hours for this giant thing. And this hasn't been finished or anything. This is just the raw part. Yeah, so we've separated it from the substrate plate. You can kind of see the uh, the edge where it peeled away. But other than peeling it off, that is unheat treated, unmachined. How about some of these other parts? I mean, this one's uh, obviously, I think even a little bit bigger than this one. By mass, it's a little larger. This is uh, closer to a three hour build. You notice it's uh, pretty hefty. Wow, yeah, this is, uh, you could lift weights with this thing. This one looks like one of the heaviest parts on the table. It is because it's much more dense than the aluminum. That part actually only builds in about one hour, just over an hour build time. Wow, one hour for a 11.9 pound part. So that's some incredible throughput in terms of how fast you can print parts with this machine. Yeah, that's one of the advantages of a cold spray additive process compared to laser powder bed fusion or binder jet or some of the other metal 3D printing processes out there. Just looking around at this trade show, it seems like a lot of the applications for uh, additive manufacturing technology are really small. But with something that prints this fast, you can really start looking at large to medium sized parts. That's a great point. I think all metal additive manufacturing processes kind of have their own niche and applications that they're good for. Historically speaking, fast parts is not one of them for metal additives. So um, definitely where our sweet spot is being able to produce large parts very quickly. How long do you think it would take to print a part like, uh, well, let's just say this kind of a part on a powder bed machine? Depending on the number of lasers, it could be as quick as one day, as long as two to three days. Wow, okay, so that's like a, uh, an order of magnitude of speed increase with your process. Absolutely. On top of that, we haven't really discussed it so far, but you actually have the ability to do builds in stages. So if I wanted to, I could build an aluminum block up to a certain height, then change powder on the systems and do a totally different copper or bronze on top of that. So you can actually build parts that are multi-material within the part itself on top of um, different alloys. Wow, there's a lot of possibility and flexibility there to do all sorts of different designs. Really all the applications haven't even been discovered or uncovered yet since this is such an emerging technology, which is a big part of why we're here today to show the, the world what our machines are capable of and it connect with uh, people like you that have ideas that we haven't even thought of yet. I saw the, a video about this. I think you had Thor at your booth last year. Yeah, um, really it's just kind of a showpiece showing the large type uh, parts we can build. As you can see, this hammer is very heavy. Let me, let me try it out. Oh yeah, this is a very heavy hammer. <laughs> how much does this weigh? Um, I think that weighs all close to 20 pounds. Wow, and uh, how long did it take to print? Um, that one builds in just over an hour. Wow, that's incredible. So 20 pounds in an hour, that's uh, quite a fast printing rate. I want everyone to smash that subscribe button and I want to give Mark a huge thanks for having us over at the Speed3D booth. 
Mark, it's a pleasure meeting you. Absolutely, thanks for coming out and uh, letting me tell you all about our cool technology. So uh, when am I gonna get one in for review? You know, I, I usually review these 3D printers at home. Um, we'll have to talk about that, run it by marketing. I, I don't know what the, uh, what the timeline might be. All right, so you heard it here first. We're gonna get one of these in the, uh, the home office. <laughs>